So I'd like to start by asking what I think everyone wants to know, which is what you dreamt about last night. Oh my god, did I put that on your Facebook? No. That's so weird. You know you put, what, are, what do you want to ask him? Yeah, yeah. And I started writing, asking what he dreamt about last night. No. And I deleted it, although I sound like a bit of a dick. Way. Because I thought, will, will people get the irony or think it's like, kind of, oh, because he has Holy a special Holy shit. Fucking weird. Okay, so let's have a look. I've actually written that down. It's right here. That's really weird. That's okay, messed up. Let's have I love look. it. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, shit. Yeah, really long dream, dude. Um, yeah. Okay. So there are certain dreams which are called filing dreams, which is where you're dreaming about what you did in the day, your hopes, your fears, yeah. your desires, those kind of things. And then you get big dreams. So big dreams is actually a technical term used by Carl Jung, used to describe dreams of kind of archetypal significance. So there's a big message going on in the dream. And in the dream, a friend of mine, um, who symbolizes to me uh, cynicism and lack of faith, like, if you want to break down the dream, often you look at the key player and say, who are they to me? And this guy, James, to me, he's cynicism. He's a good friend, but he's very cynical, complete lack of faith. And in this dream, I'd witnessed a shooting of a family, a man, a woman, and a little kid, by an unknown gunman. And I run over and I start helping um, the woman. And as she's dying, I'm telling her to remember the moments in which you were loved. And she says, what? And I say, remember the moments in which you were loved. Remember them now. Tell me them, tell me them, tell me them. And she says, why? And I say, because at least it will relax your body into a state that the bleeding will stop, which is a fucking cool idea. I'd never thought of that. It does make sense. And if you are about to die, then you'll die in a state of love. And then, um, but then the ambulance came <laughs> and she was okay. And then the gunman came back and I realized, oh shit, it's James, this guy. And then he tried to kill them again. And um, anyway, I prevented him killing them, and then I actually killed him um, as a way to protect them. And I remember feeling no guilt for the death. And I, in the dream, the punchline, the dream, often the last line is important. I said, um, I killed a man today to save three lives. And then I woke up, and I realized it was part of me that's always had, or I think, part of me that's always had a cynicism around um, settling down with my fiancé and having kids and becoming that family unit. And there was part of me... Um, <clears throat> that was maybe cynical, that maybe had a lack of faith, uh -huh. that was trying to kill this aspect. Um, but recently I've been doing a lot of work on it and, and coming around and that dream, I think, showed that I've now liberated that aspect because I killed it. And death indeed is never bad. It's, it's about kind of liberation of a certain aspect. Um, and I did feel differently the next day too. So maybe, <laughs> maybe I liberated a cynic, cool. uh, uh, cynical aspect of myself. Yeah, yeah, nice. So cool question, dude. Yeah, yeah, like, yeah I'm a cool amazed. dream. Man, I was like, oh shit. <laughs> I just like had a really shitty you imagine? <laughs> No, great answer, amazing. So actually, uh, you mentioned your fiance. I heard that you guys live in a Buddhist centre. Yeah, that's right. That sounds amazing. It must be really cool. What's it like? Well, um, <laughs> yeah, it's really cool. <laughs> yeah. There are twenty-five residents, so we live there and we pay rent. Wow. So <clears throat> a lot of kind of young professionals who are also really into Buddhism, and then there's about five or six full-time volunteers. <coughs> the Lama, a couple of nuns, and a monk. Yeah. So it's more residents actually, the monks and nuns. Yeah. And um, yeah, we live there, we, we pay rent, it's like living there. But having said that, you're surrounded by Dharma. So if you want, you can live quite a private life, you could use the side entrance and stuff. Right. But alternatively, if you want, you are surrounded by Buddhism. I mean, you wake up, you see monks and nuns at your breakfast there. You're surrounded by Dharma. So if you want to do a lot of practice, you know, if you can't practice yeah, there, you yeah. can't practice anywhere. So it's really cool and, yeah, you're just surrounded by Dharma. You're constantly reminded, you know. It, you could be, like, living on retreat, essentially, full-time if you wanted to live that way. You can. Like, once a, once a week, they do a day retreat, um, <clears throat> which we often join into, uh, join in with. And... There's a shrine room, like 10 steps from my door, so you know, if I can't meditate here, I can't meditate anywhere, dude. And I go in there to sleep, to do the dream practices yeah. in the middle of the night, it's so cool. It's so cool that probably at this time of my life, I don't know how cool it is, yeah. so I move out, and I'll be like, fuck man, those four years in the yeah, Buddhist end yeah, were yeah, so yeah. cool. Yeah. But I think actually saying so, I do appreciate it in the moment, and I do make the use of it too. Yeah, yeah. You know, I'm, <laughs> I'm using the facilities, I'm going, and you get to go to all courses for free too, which is like super nice. cool. Nice, yeah. Um, so, thanks to your tips, when I saw you at Mind, Body, Spirit, yeah. I actually did have a lucid dream. <coughs> Yay. I have to admit, and it was the hand tip, I might get you to explain that mm -hmm. in a few more reality checks later on. Um, but I got so excited in my dream that I was becoming lucid, that I woke myself up, mm -hmm. and I actually haven't got beyond that point yet, so I wondered if you had any tips for actually staying lucid in the dream, rather than getting, you know, totally over the top about yeah. it and waking up. 
So, <laughs> so ask for it. All right. It's very yeah. simple. When you're in the okay. dream, it's like they go lucidity boost yeah, yeah, yeah. Awesome. or increase lucidity. Say it out loud. Yeah. Not a question. Not asking. It's a statement of fact. Awesome. Nine times out of ten, you do that, the dream will stabilize. It seems so simple. When I first heard it, I was like, bullshit. Yeah. I can't just say something lucid dream happens. And I was like, hang on, you're in your mind. Yeah. So of course you can. In a lucid yeah. dream, you're seeing manifestation in action. Yeah. You know, if you expect to see your grandma around the corner, you walk around the corner, nine times out of ten, your grandma will be there. Because your expectation is creating manifestation. Yeah. Now, the new age guru people, whatever they call themselves, say we can do that in this state. And we can, it's yeah. true. But it takes a lot more work than some of the books do say. It takes more than a kind of a vision board, but that's not to say it's impossible. And in the lucid dream state, we're training for that. Because there are certain things in the lucid dream that seem more difficult to do, but they're not. There's no such thing as difficulty in a lucid dream. It seems sometimes easier to walk in a lucid dream than to walk through a wall. But that wall is made of the same stuff as the air you're walking through. And yet, why do we have difficulty walking through walls? Because of our mind. We create these limitations, and so too in this state too. And I think that really shows you how we can uh, engage manifestation in the waking state. Yeah. That we need to train. In the same way we need to train in lucid dream, we need to train in that. And it can take a few years, but it's well worth it. Yeah, absolutely. I don't know how we got to that after you say, oh yeah, lucidity boost, that's right. Yeah, yeah. Um, so as well as lucid dreaming, I'm really interested in astral travel. Mm -hmm. And it kind of feels like a logical next step in some ways, in my mind. Um, I wondered if you could shed some light on how the two different experiences are related or different or mm -hmm. both. Okay, so it may not be a next step, it could be a side yeah. step. Um, in a lucid dream, you're inside your own mind, mm -hmm. you're in your own psychology. Now, for a lot of us, we've got so much baggage to be unpacked that we could spend a lifetime just doing that. Once you go, once you have an out of body experience, which is where you're taking your consciousness out of your headspace and into some sort of shared universal um, mind, we can't say headspace anymore, you've got to really know what you're doing to get as much benefit from it. Um, it's a great experience to have, and if you do know what you're doing, it can be absolutely life-changing. But at the same time, I think, for me personally, I've got so much work to do internally mm -hmm. that I need to sort that out before I start going out. Mm -hmm. Now, I do go out, but it's not my main practice, and <coughs> maybe one day it will be. Um, but I think in no way uh, is OBE work an advancement on lucid dreaming. In some ways, it can actually be a bit of a sidestep because we can go there so quickly we forget to deal with our mind first. And OB, you're taking your mind into the astral. So I would far rather go into the lucid dream state first, sort out my mind, and then bring a baggage-free mind out into the astral. That's far, far safer. Because you bring your fears into the lucid dream. The cool thing in the lucid dream, you can unpack your fears. Yeah. If you have a fearful mind, you bring it into the astral, you've got to be a little bit careful out there, because you're not the only, uh, only one out there. Um, but yeah, they're different experiences, definitely. They can mm -hmm. seem confusing in the same way ice and water could seem confusing because they're made of the same stuff. Yeah. And yet they're completely different. Think yeah. of the substance of water and, and the feel of ice. Yeah. Totally different, yet the same thing. So perhaps we can use that metaphor for the lucid dream and yeah. astral. Okay. And um, so would you say you've had experiences beyond that mental projection mm -hmm. of, of lucid dreaming into the astral? And what's your experience of that been like? Well, I think before the astral, we can look at things like the collective unconscious. Mm -hmm. So if we think of the um, <clears throat> a lucid dream being like accessing the iceberg, at 90% of the iceberg that lies below the surface of the conscious mind, what does the iceberg float in? It floats in the sea. Now, to extend this metaphor, the sea would be the collective unconscious, the universal mind. That is where you go in, in, in the astral. But if you go to the edges of the lucid dream, there's kind of a partially permeable membrane where you can be both within the dream, in your mind, but gaining access to archetypal imagery that lies outside of your mind. Accessing the collective unconscious from within the safety of the lucid dream state. And that can be very, very powerful. Um, and if you ask questions there, then you're not just asking questions to your kind of higher self in your own mind. You're actually asking questions to the universe. So you can get a very, very powerful response there. Having said that, the lucid dream state can also be a place to boost straight out into the astral. So you go into the lucid dream, you do a certain meditation practice, boom, and you leave the sides. It's much easier to get out the sides of your head in the lucid dream than it is in the waking state, which is why more people have OBs, uh, kind of sleep-assisted OBs, than OBs in the waking state. But of course, it is totally possible to be sitting totally awake and have an hour body experience. There's no need for sleep, it's just one of the easier access points. 
Um, so I also wanted to ask, does your does so-called waking reality feel more unreal to you these days as, you know, a byproduct of your work? No, the opposite. Oh, interesting. Lucid dreaming makes you more grounded. Yeah. Every time you have a lucid dream, you're training yourself to tell the difference between illusion and perceived reality. Yeah. <clears throat> so far from lucid dreamers losing touch with reality, they tell the difference. What changes is you experience your experience of this is one which sees more of the dreamlike qualities within it. Yeah, yeah. So when you're projecting onto somebody, you're more likely to notice it. So you'll be psychologically projecting, and you'll be in yes. a conversation, and you'll get this feeling of lucidity, then the embarrassment will hit, yeah. oh shit, I'm totally projecting onto this person. Yeah. What you do next is totally up to you, whether you stop the conversation, whether you admit it, or whatever, but you start to wake up to those sort of projections. Yeah. And this is how we lead on to lucid living. So, no, reality seems more real in its unrealness. Yeah. You get to see that, okay, so this is more dreamlike than I thought, but it is the shared dream, and I'm in it right now. So to say, oh, is this a dream, so I'm not going to go to work, I'm going to ignore my responsibilities, that's bullshit. The opposite, I say, well, if this is a dream, then I can totally engage my responsibilities and totally help other people because they're me. If this is a dream, then you're just as worthy of respect yeah. as I respect myself. So actually, this is how compassion starts to open up through lucid dreaming. Yeah. Amazing, gorgeous. Um, so I had a question come in for you via a guy called Bob about whether you've been scared of figures in your dreams and I know you do actually reference this in your TED uh -huh. talk. I also loved what you've said um, about our shadow being the source of our creativity. Yeah. I thought that was really awesome. Well, Jung said that actually. I borrowed it from Jung. Ah. But I agree with him. <laughs> could, you, could you explain that a little further? Um, well, what's the exact quote? I can't remember. I think it's the, sh the shadow is the source of all human darkness and yet is the wellspring of all human creativity. <coughs> so, the shadow contains a lot of energy. You know, it takes a lot to maintain a fear. If you're scared of spiders, there's part of you that is constantly aware you're scared of spiders. So if I brought a spider out now and surprised you, there wouldn't be a bit of you that goes, oh, spider, oh, wait, I'm, I'm scared of spiders. It would be automatic. Yeah, yeah. So we know there's a constant switch, which is saying, I'm scared of this, or don't ask me about this, or I've got a phobia of this, or I've got past trauma of this. So, the repression of the shadow, the shadow is, is the name given to the part of the unconscious mind that we've repressed, denied or disowned. So it's like the cellar of our mind, it's all the kind of dark stuff we don't look at. A lot of power goes into suppressing that. So once you release that, you actually get a massive wellspring of energy come up. Yeah. Which will be literally physical energy, you'll feel far more energised, but also creative energy. To work with the shadow will lead to spontaneous creative insights in the waking state really fucking good ideas, amazing. which seem to come from nowhere. Yeah. And it takes you a while to go, oh, I had that really amazing idea the night after I just embraced my shadow. Oh, what a coincidence. And after years, you realize, oh, and then you cross the thread to what Jung was saying. Oh my God, I get it. Yeah. We're literally releasing creative power here because that power that used to go into um, sustaining the facade of, um, you know, I'm tough, or the facade of I'm not scared of this, actually releases and we have a lot more energy. That's awesome, I just had that experience. Yeah. It was really cool. Yeah, I woke up at like 5.30 in the morning with them. I'm, I'm, I'm re-embracing my creative side. I used Great. to be an artist, so oh. I'm headed in that direction uh -huh. again now. Um, and I woke up at 5.30 in the morning, and I was dreaming that I was creating mm. this scene, so, uh, so I'm following it. Yeah, yeah great. Yeah, 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 great to hear you say that, really cool. Um, so tell me about what's coming in book number two, because I understand that's on its way. Yes, that seems crazy, dude. You spend four and a half years <laughs> writing a book, <laughs> right. and then it's been out yeah, a year, yeah. and you write another one. So I thought, actually, God, what am I going to write about? It's going to be so long to write that. How am I going to write? And a beginner's yeah. guide, which is actually quite difficult, because you've got to pare stuff down. I realized there was loads of stuff. So I, I spent kind of a week after, a, a, I did a three-week retreat that I was running in South Africa. And I stayed next a week afterwards. And I sat in the sun and did stuff with post-it notes. I never do this kind of stuff. Proper, like, creative post-it note nice. stuff. And I was like, oh my God, there's so much stuff. Because I realized that although the book, uh, you, you know, I stopped writing that book almost two years ago now. Yeah. So, a uh, 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 year and a half ago now. So actually there's a year and a half of, of new workshop material, new teachings, and also a new kind of um, way of engaging more fun. Yeah, okay. Um, in my workshops I've been doing in the last year, I've started to bring music, I use a, literally a tightrope, yeah, uh, I get yeah, people yeah. to do creative writing exercises, so all that kind of stuff's in there. Um, 
So <laughs> there's a lot of, uh, there's tips from the pros section, that's cool. Yeah. So all of my kind of lucid dreaming buddies from around the world, nice. every chapter ends with tips from the pros. So it's like a who's who of lucid dreaming from yes. around the world. Um, it's got really nice little dip in sections. Um, it's got a strange but true sections. Yeah. It's got a lot of the techniques are similar to the ones in Dreams of Awakening because right. the techniques haven't changed much. But the approach is not, Dreams of Awakening is like a personal story. Yeah. It's Buddhism, mindfulness yeah. and lucid dreaming uh, kind of in the mix. Where this one, there is a little section on Buddhism, but there's also a section on Christianity and lucid dreaming, Sufism lucid dreaming. Um, uh, the ancient Greeks using lucid dreaming temples and just loads of kind of cool stuff. Um, much smaller, uh, much more accessible. Um, and also, probably, you know, after you spend so much time writing a real personal work, it'll probably be that one that'll sell loads. Because it's, right. you know, so that'll be great, of course, yeah. that'll be lovely. Sit there stocking filler, yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah, exactly. So a much more accessible way of entering the practice. Yeah. People who maybe aren't ready for the full-on Buddhism and death and all yeah, the stuff I talk about yeah. Dreams Awakening, but want, uh, but want to engage the practice and learn. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, you are making the practice so accessible. I mean, I think that's also wonderful about what you're doing. Uh, so, last question, really. Aside from your own work, what's been the single most impactful book, method, or teacher in your life? Well, my teacher, my guru. Right. Yeah, right. Uh, so Lama Yeshe Rinpoche, who's the abbot of um, Samalee Monastery in Scotland. Yeah. And he was the guy <laughs> who first authorised me to teach. Um, so without him, I'd really have nothing. Um, but also my other teacher, Rob Nen, he was the first person who came up with the crazy idea I should teach. It was then Lama Yesha who gave it the kind of authorization. Um, so those guys really, I kind of owe everything to because in Buddhist circles, you can't just present yourself as a teacher. Yeah. You know, it's not done, you're asked to teach. Yeah. Now, luckily, I didn't have any illusions about teaching, so it wasn't like I was hanging out waiting to be kind of chosen or anything. Yeah, yeah. It was, you know, I had a, a, a perfectly good career in the music industry and was just obsessed with dreams. So I would never have made that move. So for them, you know, at the time Rob said, give a half an hour talk at one of my workshops. And I said, yes, you can trace everything back to that moment. Awesome. Yeah. Yeah. So those guys are the most important people in my life. Just quickly, because um, I know you've spent um, something like 10 years in the hip hop dance scene, right? So I heard about your workshops that combine dance and dreaming. How does that work? Because I'm a massive Five Rhythms fan. I love oh, it cool. so much. So, so, so I work with... Uh, Yakov and Susanna from uh, School of Movement Medicine right. and they had trained in uh, Five Rhythms for about 10, 11, 12 years with Gabriella Roth doing the full-on apprentice training and everything. Then they set up their own thing about, must be about 10 years ago now I think, Movement Medicine which is like, it's like Five Rhythms but it brings in uh, a lot more me meditation, a lot more psychological work, kind of shamanic aspect too. And I've got a retreat with them in September I think in Devon awesome. and I just got back from uh, Holland doing a retreat with another Movement Medicine teacher. So it's a lucid dreaming workshop, but in every break, just hit on big tunes and everyone's moving and dancing. Right. <coughs> then in the morning, dancing out our dreams as well, rather yeah. than writing down. Really good way to get in your body. Cool. You know, lucid dreaming is dancing with your unconscious. Yeah. So if you can do that in the daytime, all the better. Love it. Awesome. I'm going to try to come to one of those. Okay. So I have a little something for you. I mentioned I was um, heading into creativity again. Mm -hmm. So when I saw you Mind, Body, Spirit, you gave us all postcards, yeah. right, that said, are you dreaming, to stick in a place that we don't necessarily look at every day. Yeah. Um, or, or all the time, rather, maybe a couple times a day. So I made a little alternate version for you. Oh, cool. <laughs> yeah, oh, it's an octagon. So it's like um, I'm doing a series at the moment which are road signs. It's yeah, just that's like there's cool. a sense of emergency around it, so I wanted that one to be like, stop, <coughs> And I would have big connection with octagons. Oh, so the yes. place I did the three-week retreat in South Africa was is the octagon, the shrine of okay. the octagon shit. And also ran the most successful breakdance tour ever, around was called the octagon tour. We had to hey. break dance in this octagon shape. So yeah, you've just combined wow. the two things. Like it's, it's really weird you chose Wow, that's a nice shape. little synchronicity yeah. we've had. That's cool. Cool, that's great, thank you. I'll My pleasure, yeah. So I get to keep this thing yes, and put yes, it in yes, perfect absolutely. Keep it safe. Thank you. Oh, that's really nice, thank you. My absolute pleasure. Thank you so much for your time. Oh, thank you. Mwah. I was so nervous. Thank you for putting me at ease. What are you nervous about? I've never done anything like this before. I'm used to doing it all online. Oh. So it's quite new for me. It's the first time we've sort of done this kind of yeah. backstage interviews thing. Yeah, yeah. Actually, the whole, see how it goes. the whole kind of public speaking, feeling like I need to perform thing is something I'd like to 
explore in lucid dreaming yeah. actually because it's such a massive fear for me i have ancient history with it's it it's a great place for that you yeah. know a woman at one works that's recently had body uh, image issues so in yeah. lucid dream she was walking around naked Wow. And she said it completely changed everything. Wow. And people were responding to her like they wouldn't say, oh my God, what's she doing? But she knew it was all illusion. Yeah. But she was just walking, embracing her own body. She was so sweet. The older French room said, and the first thing I thought was, have I done my bikini line? Oh. <laughs> I said, but I realized it doesn't matter, I'm in a dream. <laughs>